Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Leading us on this journey are the hosts of the Mind Vine Podcast, Daryl Mathers and Chris Bovey. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers. This is my co-host Chris Bovey. Welcome. And we're, wel- we're pleased to welcome Todd Leader as our guest. Todd is a lot of things. You got uh, quite the bio, but right now you're an author and you've just put out the book, It's Not About Us, The Secret to Transforming the Mental Health and Addiction System in Canada, which is a pretty interesting secret because I know there's a lot of people interested in the answer. So maybe We'll hold up the book, and you can tell us a little bit about uh, a little bit about it. Sure. Uh, well, this book is taking uh, uh, <clears throat> kind of a different approach to the idea of what it means for uh, for us to use the term client-centered. So, when you talk about any healthcare service, talk to nurses, doctors, psychologists; they all talk about client-centered care or patient-centered care. And so, that really means that when the patient or the client is with that healthcare provider, they're getting compassion and empathy, and and getting treatment that's that's customized. To them and and so we all understand that part but what's missing is that at the administrative and policy and procedural level uh, where we don't think from a client-centered perspective administrators don't typically think that way so we don't notice the fact that some of the hoops that we create are actually bad for our clients and are causing the inefficiencies that that are are contributing to things like wait times and lack of access and dissatisfaction in the public so when the public actually uh, complains to the media, for instance, you know, all around the country, this is happening constantly. They're not saying that nurse that 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 provided me with care was mean. They're not saying the psychologist didn't know how to do therapy. They're saying I had to wait too long. I, I had to fill out too many forms. I, three different people asked me the same questions. It's all procedural stuff. Mm-hmm. So I was rushed out of the system. That's yeah. So it's the system. That's what I refer to as the system. And what I'm saying is, we need to create a client-centered system, in which those client-centered healthcare providers can work. Mm-hmm. One of uh, our, our former colleagues. Our Ian, Dr. Ian Daw, he was a physician in chief at Ontario Shores for a number of years. I'll never forget him saying this when we talk about the system. He goes, it's, not a, it's a system with a small S, not a capital S, because if it was a system with a capital S, we'd be talking to each other. You'd be able to yeah. navigate through it seamlessly. And I know, I mean, there's a difference between how the provincial and, and federal system works and, that, and funding, and there's a, a lot of different equations to it, but it really is not a system. Yeah, and the, actually, one of the the phrases I've come to use uh, uh, is that it's we've never. The, one of the problems is we've never designed the system; it has evolved. Mm-hmm. You know, it started out with people like Sigmund Freud and someone lying on a couch and 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 him telling somebody what was wrong with them. That paternalistic expert approach. It you know it, it evolved into asylums and then and then deinstitutionalization and but it, it just evolved. Nobody ever sat down and said, well, if we were designing a system today to be mm-hmm. really what's best for the public to enhance the, our, our rates of mental health and reduce our rates of mental illness, how would we design it? And that's what I've attempted to do in this book is, is from experience having, having transformed a, a program in Nova Scotia, uh, tried to kind of give some, some concrete ways to do that, but from the client's perspective. And so that's the interesting part of it. So I, I would sit with my leadership team and I'd say things like, okay, let's say we were working on the intake process. And I'd say, okay, so what's a client-centered intake process? And so, you know, what would it look like? And so they'd be generating ideas that all sounded theoretical. Mm-hmm. Didn't feel real enough. So I said, okay, s- stop, let's change for a minute. Pretend the client is your son. Pretend the client is your mother mm-hmm. or your sister. Now take a minute and now tell me, how do you want the intake system to work? Suddenly the answers became very real Mm -hmm. and people's patience and tolerance for bureaucracy dropped. There was none anymore and it just made sense. The answers were just absolutely clear. Here's the way it should be. So when I call, I should not, if I'm, if I'm, you know, if, uh, if someone is calling who has uh, depression or anxiety and they call and they get uh, a a menu tree, an automated Mm -hmm. message that says, you know, pick one for this, two for this, three for this, four for this. 
well, if I've got depression, I'm not telling you what you're doing. And I, I do live with the depression, so I can relate sure. to this. My, my sense of self-worth is dropping because I'm not even important enough for a real person to answer the phone. Mm -hmm. That's my interpretation. If I've got anxiety, I'm stressed because I don't know if I'm going to pick the right one. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so that's a system issue that, in fact, is bad for the people it's supposed to be serving. Right? And, but coming at it from the client's perspective and asking those questions, you suddenly realize, well, that particular issue, it should be a real person answering the phone, first of all, mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be the, the, the person who has the most seniority and wanted that job or the person who's the best data entry clerk. Mm -hmm. It should be somebody who's nice. Mm -hmm. right. It should be somebody who's warm. You know when you're, dealing, when you're talking to somebody who cares about you. So should we be, I mean, can we do this ourselves or do we need to involve people lived experience in co-design to help change the system? Well, I think we need to be able to understand the experience of people who have been mm -hmm. through the system and right. who do live with various kinds of illnesses. So otherwise, we have to have a, a team of people who have an incredible amount of empathy mm -hmm. or who have family members who right. have lived with it. And I mean, you, you, there has to be, you have to come at it really from that mm -hmm. perspective right. in order to create the kind of system that really fits them. Right. As, and, and, you know, clients, uh, you know, people with with mental illness and addiction problems, they are different. Their needs are different mm -hmm. than people with other health care needs. Yeah. And so, therefore, the things we do are different. Mm -hmm. You know, if I've got knee problems, I'm calling an orthopedic clinic. I don't care if I have to listen to a menu tree and pick an item because mm -hmm. my knees don't affect my ability to process that. Right. Do you feel, generally speaking, the system that or systems that we have in place now uh, operate on that kind of physical health kind of process that's based, like that's rooted in traditional medical appointments, or you know, is that what we need to kind of break away from? We need to identify the kind of the uniqueness of mental illness. Absolutely, we we our system across the country is primarily a pathology oriented medical type of model and it doesn't allow for uh, flexibility for uh, for adapting to the unique needs so another example this is just a it's a really simplistic one but it makes the point um, so I, I have I have knee problems so if I need to go to an, an arth, uh, uh, a knee replacement clinic that's that's one issue but if I'm if I have somebody um, well, okay sorry let me back up a second so we're used to waiting right when we show up for appointments we're used to waiting in all healthcare. We're used to w showing up waiting in a waiting room. And so we expect people to wait. That's why we call it a waiting room. Uh, otherwise, we'd call it a hallway. But, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a waiting room because we plan for you to wait. Okay, that's fine. If I'm, if I'm getting something else done, then waiting doesn't actually hurt me. Mm -hmm. But if I have depression and I'm sitting in a waiting room, my, my one o'clock time has come and it's 20 minutes later and nobody has come to see me yet, I'm unimportant my self-worth has dropped or what if for instance I have anxiety problems and it's social anxiety and you're making me sit in a public space with strangers mm -hmm. you're directly causing harm to the exact illness you're supposed to be treating mm -hmm. it's not just allowing me to suffer the waiting it's directly harming the illness that I'm here for and so the analogy I use is it's the same as if the knee replacement clinic that I'm going to is on the third floor of a building with no elevator the process of getting to it actually makes my condition worse. And we just, but we don't think that way. We don't think about the uniqueness of the way the systems need to be designed. Right. And perhaps the most authoritarian thing I've ever done actually as a leader in the system was sent out an email one day saying to staff, as of tomorrow, if somebody shows up on time for their appointment, they will be seen on time. It doesn't matter what else you're doing, you'd stop. You can be doing case notes from a previous client. You might be on the phone with, a, with somebody and it might be in a meeting with your boss. Doesn't matter. Stop because seeing the client on time comes first. If the client, if we're saying we're client centered, that means the client comes first. And the only mm -hmm. exception was if you're with the previous client and that person happens to be in crisis. Mm -hmm. Other than that, so four or five days later after it sort of caught on, the waiting room became a hallway. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd walk through and there'd be somebody there and by the time I walked back a minute later they'd be gone it was it was incredible just that simple a, a change changed the experience of the clients so do we need to just completely tear it down it seems like it's easy and we tend to put fresh paint on a car with no engine that we, we we kind of try and fix little things instead of starting from ground one do you, mm -hmm. do you think 
we need to just break it down and start over? Yeah, well, what we did, uh, you know, the approach that I took uh, was really to, to take the concept of transforming quite literally. And so, you know, transforming doesn't mean tweaking. It doesn't mean, you know, just continuing to sort of help it evolve. Right. It means taking, strategically taking a certain part of a system and saying, what should it be? Mm -hmm. And then just figure out how to make that change. Right. Simple as that. But not just, well, what could be an improvement we could make? That's a different question mm -hmm. than what should it be, right? The what should it be is the, is the plain white board. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was your mother, how would you want it to work? So we actually took, we followed the path of a client from the time somebody in the community says, says you know, to himself or herself or to a family member, I think I need help with my drug use or my depression. From that moment, what happens? Well, first they look for a phone number. Well, what if there are multiple phone numbers because every clinic has its own number? Yeah. Which one do I call? Well, that's not client-centered, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Make one number. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. whether, whether it costs you more, or it's because it, it's not about us mm -hmm. in the system. It's exactly. about the, the client, right? So we traced the path one step at a time through the system and completely transformed. Mm -hmm. um, so you know. that's great. Can we, I mean, can we as providers, whether it's hospitals and community agencies, do you think we can do this on our own or do we need someone to force? I think it's still kind of everybody has done things, has their own kind of turf we talked about before. Do you think we'll all come together and do what's right for our clients or so do we need someone to hold history. our hand? Yeah. There's so much history in, the, in, in these organizations and we're not excluded from that where you've had your area for so long. You're so, you know, you're, you pride yourself in doing a great work in that area and mm -hmm. the thought of everybody coming together yeah. uh, independently on their own um, I mean it sounds great do you think it'll ever happen well I think it's completely in the hands of leadership actually mm -hmm. uh, and so because I think care providers themselves they typically uh, most I would say actually have no problem coming together mm -hmm. to to really think in a client-centered way because they've been trained to people don't become social workers and nurses and psychologists to get rich you know, they, or to have the best working hours. They do it because, I mean, I teach university, I teach undergrad, and they do it because when they're in their first or second year of, of undergrad, they, they think, well, you know, I want to do something to help people, and I think it's nursing probably, or I think it's social work. Mm -hmm. It just comes from a, a naive altruism that they have at that age, and that's why they get into it. So the motivation to do this is there among the care providers. I, I believe that it's at the management and leadership level where people need to start to say, we're going to create a system that actually supports philosophically the kind of work that you, the care provider, want to be able to provide. Mm -hmm you know, that supports that thinking. Mm -hmm. Like my part of it is the system. Your part of it is the care. Yours is right. Mm -hmm. Mine sucks. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's, it's at that leadership level where there needs to be that push to say, we're gonna, we're gonna make this philosophical shift mm -hmm. and not pathologize everybody and not wait until they're ill in order to see them. We're gonna start supporting people to stay well and, you know, it's, there's all kinds of system stuff that really is in the hands of leadership. It's very possible to do. Uh, what part of that is the fact that the people in these leadership positions, uh, they come from these human, uh, these areas where they're, you're helping other people, right? They're human specific causes or they're providing care to people. They're clinicians, they're nurses, they're not they're not business people. Mm -hmm. They're not right. You know, they might have taken a couple classes and they probably educated themselves as they, as they've climbed, but inherently they're in a field where they were trained to deliver direct care, not necessarily run an organization. Right. So how much do you think that kind of the way that the leadership is structured and the way these organizations are structured and the people, the skills that these, these people have kind of influences kind of the, 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 the status of the system currently. Yeah, I've addressed that in my book quite directly because in, in most of our public services, certainly in the healthcare system, there is kind of an unstated tradition of sorts, but sort of a common practice, and that is that the person in a program area that is the best at that profession tends to be the one that rises to the top and ends up being the manager. So, you know, the, the best, most experienced nurse in, the, in a medical unit becomes the head nurse or the, or the nurse manager for that unit. Okay, that's fine, so the person knows how to do nursing. 
but now is in a job that doesn't require you to know how to do nursing, requires you to know how to lead people, or, or sorry, how to manage people. Mm. And so that's the equivalent of me having an electrical problem in my house and going out and finding the best plumber to come and fix it. Mm. These are different skill sets. Why would you hire the, the best nursing skills for a, for a management skill set? And then, because somebody's in a management role doesn't mean that person is a leader. Mm -hmm. which is a whole other thing. Leadership mm -hmm. is about visioning and inspiring people, and not all managers do that. Some are fantastic at keeping the train on the tracks. Mm -hmm. A leader is about finding new tracks, mm -hmm. right? Which is this stuff, yeah. right? Yep. This kind of transformation does not require a manager. It requires leaders who can envision a new future and help, help support the managers to make those changes mm -hmm. to get there. And we don't necessarily hire for those competencies. We, we tend to promote from within. We reward people for being really great at what they yeah. do. And the, I mean, the, but the flip side that I'll give you is that because the, many people come from being care providers and rise up through the system, at least they come with empathy. Mm -hmm. They come understanding that part of it. The question is, do you have the leadership in place to tap into that part mm -hmm. to say, now apply that empathy to your management decisions, mm -hmm. to your process decisions, to your, mm -hmm. you know, the system stuff, your budget, your, your paperwork. Yeah, so <clears throat> they've gone through their career with thinking of strictly internally, and now they're in a system, and they may not have that skill set or that concept, so a lot of their focus will be internally on changes internally and not big picture. Yeah, and not necessarily thinking about what, what it is that the, the public needs, right? Mm -hmm. So I make a distinction between private practice and public service. Uh, and so I mean, if I'm in private practice as a clinical psychologist or a clinical social worker, then my clients, by definition, are just the people who come in my door. Mm. The rest of the public is irrelevant to my practice. But if it's a public service, you know, a, a part, of, part of a government-funded service, the entire public, in fact, is my client. Mm -hmm. So the healthy people are my clients, and my job is to keep them mentally healthy. But our system doesn't do that. Our system typically waits until you're ill and provides care mm -hmm. or treatment. So we really have a mental illness care system, not a mental health system. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're, we're failing to provide the right services to the majority of the population by, by keeping healthy people healthy through evidence-based approaches that we know will reduce the incidence of mental illness and therefore reduce the demand on the system later. Today, you, um, you appeared on a panel uh, at the Mental Health for All conference here, the CMHA National Conference, and I mean, you're talking a lot about this subject, transforming mental health and addictions. I'm sure with your book, you've you know, spoken on a number of occasions uh, about the content of the book and your ideas. How well or how are they received from people who work in the system every day? Hmm. Uh, uh, I'll tell you that the, the um, I guess I'll, let me segment the populations that I end up talking to. The general public, first of all, they, um, their response is absolute excitement. Mm -hmm. People, the most common phrase that I hear, oddly enough, and I'm sort of paraphrasing in a sense, is thank God somebody's finally saying this that it should be designed around the client. And so the general public, this is what they've wanted to hear. This is a system that they believe is right uh, because they're tired of seeing a system designed to meet the system's needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and people who are doing direct care provision, most of them end up with a similar response because they feel like their hands are tied. Mm -hmm. You know, well, we're not allowed to do this. We have to do it this way because this program is standardized. Standardization is the enemy of client-centeredness mm -hmm. because it actually says everybody's the same. It says, you know, we're going to create a program that runs in ex exactly this way and whoever you are, whatever your needs are, you have to fit in this box mm -hmm. instead of creating a system that flexes around your needs. So care providers, uh, you know, they've been trained to think as, at, about individual clients differently. And uh, so they tend to love this as well because they feel like the, the system and the powers above them are what constrains them from doing their best mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And then the third sector is the, is the people in the management and leadership positions. And I get a mix of responses there. But I can tell you the response uh, where I've done the most work so far in New Brunswick, in PEI and in Newfoundland and Labrador, the response from the leadership there has been absolutely embracing this concept. Mm -hmm. 
absolutely saying, yeah, this is, a, this is where we need to go. This is the next stage in terms of really intentional transformation, not just tweaking and not just, you know, I mean, Trudeau's government has added a, a ton more money to the system and everybody's mm -hmm. been screaming for just more, more, more. But more of the same doesn't give us mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. You know, what we need is different. And yeah, I love the idea of refusing to accept a model just because it's been in place for 100 years. Right? And I think not just in mental health, we oh, do yeah. that in education. We yeah. do that in all these important facets of our life. We just, even though the world has changed dramatically since like we were kids, or even like the, the world's changed so much in the last 10 years, yeah. yet we're still using a, models in, all, in so many facets of our life that are antiquated. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. But the, so what's the reason for it? I mean, who do we blame for that? So if you look at the people who are in the manager roles now and in the director roles and the VP roles in all these organizations that are providing mental health and addiction care, is it their fault? Well, no, because, I mean, if you were hired into a manager role, somebody above you says to you, here's the role. Here's the job description. Do that job. And you agree to do that job that way in exchange for a paycheck. Mm. And so you assimilate into that historic model. Yeah. It's not your fault. Mm -hmm. You're just doing what that job exists as right now. And, and at each level, that's what it is. People simply assimilate into the current culture, which is far from being current. Right. And you've seen mm -hmm. in other countries, in other areas, I think of Finland and education, where they actually tore down the model. They yeah. actually, they weren't happy with the way things were going. They weren't getting the results they wanted. And instead of uh, tweaking it and mm -hmm. looking for a new coat of paint or something like that, they actually, they tore it down and they rebuilt mm -hmm. it. And they've, they're now seeing success. It'd be nice to see that in this country. Yeah, yeah and I, that would bring me to the fourth group. And I wonder what your take is because you need that to, to make transformation is how is it received by levels of government? Yeah. Uh, well, um, they won't take us calls. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are lots of people who won't take my calls, but that's a different issue. That's a personality problem. Uh, uh, I think that the those that I've dealt with so far uh, have actually embraced the concept because what they what they can see in it is that the public loves it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So, I mean, if you even if you just even if you have the most <laughs> self-serving elected officials, which, you know, I think actually that's kind of rare. I think the system cr creates that. But mm -hmm. but even in that case, this is the language the public wants to hear. So yeah. if anybody that wants the platform that's going to help them get elected, get voted, get votes from people who care about mental health and addictions. This is the language the public wants because they mm -hmm. scream about this. They right. love it. And uh, so, uh, you know, the reception is good once they get the concept. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, I'm really clear in this book in saying that this is not a model. I'm not proposing a new model for our system. I'm proposing a paradigm shift in the way we answer questions about the system, the way we make decisions about the system. So I'm proposing mm -hmm. that we apply the principle of client-centeredness and there's some particular methods like using questions like what if it was your son, what if it was your mother, using those kinds of ways to, to ensure that you really are. Mm -hmm. So I'm just proposing a method of starting that transformation and just go step by step using that, that philosophical shift. And you can mm -hmm. end up with any kind of program. Right. They don't have to look the same. In fact, I'm kind of opposed to that because, as I say, standardization is the enemy of client-centeredness because it's... Mm -hmm. By design, it doesn't adapt from one community to another. And I mean, I come from Nova Scotia. You you you, you drive 50 kilometers in any direction, you've entered a different culture. <laughs> now you know. And so, if programs don't adapt, if they're not flexible for that, then you're failing. You're failing to meet the needs of the public, even though you're a public service. Mm -hmm. The book is It's Not About Us: The Secret to Transforming the Mental Health and Addiction System in Canada. And where can you get this? It's available on Amazon, Chapters Indigo, Coles, uh, Smashwords, iTunes, uh, or at my own website, which is www.itsnotaboutus.ca. Well, thank you very much for joining us. That was, was a, a lot of fun chatting, and uh, best Thanks. of luck. Thank you very much. Great. That was fun. Thank you. Thanks.